We have a lot to cover in 30 minutes, so we are going to go through and do a very quick lightning round, self-introductions. I'm going to start with Tim at this end and work my, or at the far end, work my way back. Just let us know your name, your organization, uh, the communities you represent, and then any of the uh, disasters that you have uh, personally worked through. Okay. Well, thank you. Welcome, everyone. My name is Tim Zahner with the Sonoma Valley Visitors Bureau. Who here is from out of town? Raise your hand. Quick, raise your hand. Keep your hand up if you're staying in a hotel. Oh my God, I love the TOT, thank you. So um, I'm with the Visitors Bureau. My job is to promote people to come here, have a good time, support our local businesses, and go home. And I represent the area from roughly the San Pablo Bay up to Santa Rosa. So that's the Sonoma Valley, and it is God's chosen place on this earth, Mark, as you know. So thank you. Hi, I'm Lynn Knight. Um, I live in Virginia now. I grew up in California. I have worked in 23 states and US territories that have had very serious disasters. And my specialty is economic recovery. I'm an economic developer, and um, I became really passionate about working in disaster recovery in starting in 2014 when I was vice president of the International Economic Development Council. And we placed um, economic development volunteers in communities across the country, and they really needed help um, for community leaders. Aloha. Uh, aloha kako. My name is Kaliko Lehua Store. Uh, I belong to a few organizations. I've been with Hyatt Hotels for the last 26 years. I help to steward the second rainiest place on earth, according to past data at Pukukui Watershed. And then I was minding my own business, and the mayor called and said, uh, can you be a part of my advisory committee? So I wear multiple hats today. I'm sitting here to talk about what we're currently going through in the wild, uh, Lahaina wildfires. So I'm still going through it. But happy to be here and happy to support you. And I'm happy to go home, too. <laughs> Wonderful. We're very excited to have you all. Thank you all for participating in this. Uh, first things first, I want to just go over a quick note about the tone that we're planning to use today. In our planning meeting, we got together and we were discussing, this can be a, a sensitive topic. A lot of people may have just been through something really traumatic. And we were wondering, what, what's the right fit for us tone-wise? Should we be... Uh, polite and kind and thoughtful, or should we really just say, screw it, let's let's be direct and, and honest and blunt about things and as candid as we can be. And we decided to err on the side of being direct and honest and blunt because we think that that's something, A, that will be most helpful for you, and B, that's what's going to get things done when you're recovering from an emergency. So that's our plan, and uh, we hope that that ends up being as helpful as we had thought. I want to start off the conversation by just talking big picture. Uh, the role of the economy in recovery. Obviously, the human needs are the first thing that everybody thinks of and the most important, but then what role does the economy play? Aside from tax revenue, we all know the importance of that. Talk about some of the things that getting businesses back open and having your economy up and running again can do. Jobs, jobs, jobs. If I don't have a job, I can't fix my house and there is no hope to feed my family. So you've got to get the small businesses back up and running quickly. What I'll say to that is uh, late December uh, 2023, when we were thinking about, you know, it just happened in August. And so I think about while we were planning this, uh, this panel, I said, man, in December of 2023, I wasn't thinking about work. I wasn't thinking about the economy because we had so many different variables that were happening and uh, to be blunt and that direct and honest is we hadn't thought about that. And then not knowing that the difference, especially the private sector, that we may have been housing people, but you take out the housing for those that were staying in the hotels, you have an occupancy of 30%. If you've got a hotel worth of 900 employees, not all of them can swing hammers come April, May into 2024. So... That's what I think about is what is that balance? When do you talk about economy? Because months after the fire, we weren't thinking about economy. We were thinking about not sleeping in a tent. And if I could just add on that one of the things I think when a, after a fire or disaster, an intangible benefit is the morale boost that you get when your favorite ice cream shop is back online and suddenly people are like, we're returning to normalcy. Right, and I think that's a huge part because people that popped up on social media, right? Like such and such is back, and such and such made it. So I think that's it. It is becoming a cheerleader for the community that we're back. We're different, but we're back. Yeah, great, um, Kaliga. You mentioned 
that balance of the human needs versus a local economy. Talk a little bit about that. Obviously, that's really one of the most sensitive points of recovery is how to walk that line where you're being respectful of people with what they've just been through, but also uh, nothing's getting back to normal until the economy is back up and running. So can you guys go through some of what your experience has been in terms of finding that balance? How do you know what the right tone is and um, what it's like working through that challenge? You know, I, I cannot help but to thank uh, our mayor, and obviously it's a different administration today. And to be able to really like settle down and then try to organize community, and really that's what he was, keep Kama'aina people home, keep, keep people of this land home. And that's a tough one because in Hawaii, you know, most per, a large percentage comes from the tourism industry. And, and there's some that you cannot put out into the different sectors because that's all they know. And so it was such a hard balance. And I mean, talk about not wanting to walk in the public because you belong to hotel, because you've chosen to go down that avenue. But when the mayor was bold enough to create an advisory committee that was so different, I mean, my goodness, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know any of them, really. And to be able to sit in a room to know that we're gonna have differences, and he knew that. And to be able to say, okay, when's the right balance? I mean, you got 10 million ideas thrown at him, and he says, Some, there's gonna have to be somebody else that, and to the point where, I'll say this, to the point where some of the private sectors said, how does this co advisory committee even qualify? Where's, they don't belong at the table, we belong at the table. And I said, wow, that's reality. Because maybe previously, and I won't, you know, maybe previously the people of the community were not at tables. So it's such a fine balance, but I believe that we're working through it. And I can tell you a year later, all of us on the same plane, I mean, let's talk about it. Lynn, any experience? One of the things I've, in the disasters I've worked at, and I, I work largely now as a contractor to the U.S. Economic Development Administration, and we manage the economic recovery support function for FEMA. And I have a playbook that I kind of go through for every mission. And the first thing is to look at what is actually going on with the economy, what has been lost. I mean, I don't know if when you want to throw up a slide, but I have a slide on that. And communities always underestimate, always. They always underestimate how long it's gonna take, how fast the businesses are gonna get back up, and what the multiplier affects. And on, I have to tell you, on Maui, it is, it is so huge, and it's not over, and it hasn't turned the corner yet, and I worry about it. And what I would say is, spread the work. You know, yes, you want to achieve balance, but there are different people that want to work on different things. What have we seen here? There are people that are working to help kids. That's great. People whose expertise is housing and mitigation and, and environmental impacts. Well, there are people who want to help businesses. And your chamber of commerce, your um, destination marketing organization, industry groups, and us, we have you know five or six federal agencies that have specialties in different aspects of the economy. We are there to help that. So don't prevent the support to businesses. It should happen as fast as you can because you can imagine these small businesses don't have a lot of resources that they can wait. And Lynn, your slide just popped up. Okay, let me show you just real fast. So this is what's happened to employment. You can see unemployment spiked up really fast. In July, it's getting better. It's still higher than the state by a couple points, um, but it's, it is coming down. This is where we've lost jobs. I would be so very surprised if we can turn that around fast. We've lost over 2,000 jobs in restaurants alone, and it impacts a lot of other businesses, suppliers, even farmers have been telling me it's tough because they were selling to restaurants. Can you go on the next slide? This is some tourism impacts. So what I can see in air service, when you're on an island, that's the only way you can come. So for months now, we've been tracking this, and air service is down about 25%. We are told it may go down further until demand comes up. We're also tracking where on the island, how different hotels are doing. 
The hotels in West Maui actually did better for a while than everyone else because they had the bump from uh, survivor families. Um, that's changing now. I think there's one more slide. This is the money slide that I sleep, can't sleep at night thinking about. These are the, this is the shortfall that tourism has brought into the island. It's already, this is 10 months worth of data. It's already been $2 billion down. And that's with no multiplier effects. So with multipliers, our economist is telling me it's way over $3 billion in losses out of, the, out of all the businesses on the island. And then what does that mean to the government? So the state tax loss is already $292 million, and the, and the county's you know, getting close to $80 million in 10 months. Who has the kind of money to take that out of your local government budget? It's really a lot. And it's not going to turn fast. So the reason why I keep tracking this is because I feel like just showing people simply what's happening, um, you know, we can project what we need to do to adjust in the future. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Tim, we've worked together quite a bit on uh, tourism. There's always that friction between tourism and uh, residents of the community. Talk a little bit about that balance of uh, after an emergency, you know, getting everybody together and uh, finding the balance of best for the economy versus just human sure. needs. Yeah, and I think, and Kalika, you have a great point there. When, when you're in a place that was affected by a fire that is a tourism economy, you got a double whammy, right? You've got people who may have lost their homes uh, yeah. or their businesses, and then people don't show up, shown by the red indicators up there, then they might lose their jobs, right? Um, we had a problem here where after the fires, people didn't come, the hotels were full with, we love our FEMA friends, but it was full of people who weren't here for leisure travel, right? And they were, they were full of contractors and insurance agents and stuff like that, which was displacing further leisure travel. There is that weird, um, not weird, but that tension between the people that live here and the people who come to visit. I know it's very acute in, in Hawaii. Um, we had to thread that needle and say, look, it's crucial that we have to support our local businesses, but we have to take care of our residents first. And we can talk more about that when like the messaging gets to but. Um, I think I just want to go back for both of these things. It's about patience, right, and grace. You talk about being at the table. The most important part is, like, everyone's nerves are raw. Everyone's angry. Everyone's scared. And you just have to, like, take a step back and breathe and give people a bit of grace because otherwise you're not going to get things solved. So I have a lot of those grumpy meetings, and uh, <laughs> you just got to get through those. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you all. Um, one of the things that I noticed on your slide was the, the huge impact on the food service and the hospitality industries. And one of the things that came up here after 17 fires and during COVID, uh, and I would imagine you guys have seen this in a few places, is people in an in a economy like ours, it's so dependent on the hospitality industry. And one of the things that you'll see is elected officials saying, well, we need to diversify our local economy so this doesn't happen, which, not a bad idea, but timing-wise, it can be something that's maybe not the top priority when you're coming out of an emergency. Talk a little bit about that instinct, what things you see, what, what, what are the things that pop up, ideas that are vague, big picture ideas. <laughs> Lynn's ready. Lynn, take it away. So as an economic developer, I will tell you that diversifying your economy is the hardest job of all, and the worst time to try to do it is right after a disaster. Um, it's a long-term prospect. You need to be very deliberate and holistic about it, and you need to look at your targets in a fact-based way. Uh, we've looked very deeply at Maui's targets, and they're all industries that are going to take a long time to develop, and they have their own issues. I think it's better to focus on what you've got, the businesses that have gotten their foot, feet on the ground, that have skin in the game, focus on them first, and then make diversification a long-term goal, which is a res good resilience measure anyway. I, yeah, I mean, Mark, just after the firefighters leave, the next person should not be as someone with a PhD in economics, right? Like, right. The, we love them. They're great. But... You're wonderful. Okay. But <laughs> it's really like, let's get people back to work and, and so they can feed their families. And then let's talk about the long-term stuff. Yeah. Calico? You know, when uh, we had our pre-planning with Lynn and she said that, I almost felt like I got punched in the gut. 
no, it's all good. And I, that's why I told you to be blunt. And, and the reality is, is, is that it was hard. And, and I'm, I'm someone, <clears throat> I, was, I learned at a very young age, uh, to dominate, you got to infiltrate. And, and that, to me, meant you've got to be at the table. And if the table is in hospitality, then you have to tell the story of our people or somebody else is going to write it. And somebody else is going to tell it. And so for, for my Ohana and I, we are a very hospitable family, whether a hotel or not. And so to be a part of that type of environment for me is educational. But when she had shared that with me, because we love our Aina and because as a people we have had historical trauma, and all of our children, from our grandparents, parents, you know, young adults, into the children of where we are from, they know their history. And we're not quite, we, we are, you know, when the fires happen, the chains went up, the doors went up, the dogs came out, because we were checking everybody at the ramp. And that's not really our, that's not the way we were raised, but all this trauma had come back. So when we're talking about this not diversifying, man, she kind of shook me in a way to say, okay, maybe you got to get up 30,000 more feet in the air, in the air to be able to see this because... I remember a situation that I was a part of in December about a contract that was hoping to come in April. And at the time, our emotions were so high that all we wanted to do was lock the gate. Lock the gate, throw a, you know, put a rock in the middle of the road, close the road. And these are real things because we were trying to protect all we had left. And then now to think we had come through April and I personally, because I was living in the hotel and I was part of this environment, that is where, you know, that is how I provided a comfortable life for my family and became a homeowner at a young age, that I had to really look back and I said, wow, where is this? Where do I go now? And I work in the world of conservation and I can tell you, maybe I can afford a small car, a very standard car, maybe not live as comfortable as I live now. And so I think, how do we diversify? And I live and I, I'm around movers and shakers and thinkers and visionaries that travel all over the continent. And I think, how fast can we, change, can we turn this boat to be able to diversify our economy? And when she said that to me, I thought, well, maybe we can't change it as quick. And so I posed this and I threw it out to the owners of our hotel. And I said, I'm going to first tell you something. I don't want you to own land. You're not going to own land. But I want you to think about those innovative ideas, to think how do you become a natural, uh, a naturalist, uh, a natural resources specialist, someone that can be stewards of their own land division like our elders had taught us. I said, don't give me the answer. I said, let's get to a table because how do we diversify is everything that is above us in the second rainiest place on earth has to come down or not. So. That I'm not saying don't try to diversify. Believe me, I've been all over the targets and trying to figure out how to help them happen faster. And I did a paper recently uh, called uh, Barriers to Business Recovery, or really studied what those other industries need. And I see ways, but I just don't see it being fast. And it's not a reason to leave your existing businesses behind while you try to diversify. Great. I'll add one more thing. I was part of a seminar, and uh, I, was, I learned from, the, uh, from our farmers in Maui. And one of the elders, you know, he's a, very much a trailblazer. And he had said, he goes, you know, the thing about it is that our community on Maui needs to get in with local government. They need to lobby because the percentage, the amount of money that is allocated for, the depart for farmers is such a, less than a percent. And I thought, Wow. You know, so it doesn't just happen with diversifying and changing it, but it happens with what the, they said about building relationships with your local government and those that you can trust and help to change the trajectory of your economy. Great. Thank you. I want to turn the page and move uh, more directly into uh, business recovery and how we can support them and what are the right steps for communities to take to support their business community. Um, right out of the chute, right after an incident in those immediate hours and days. Those are very complicated times. We've already talked about the emotional side of it. So let's talk about what can people do in those first few days. You may not get something done, but you can plant a seed for something that can be productive uh, later on. What are those immediate steps that you guys have seen that are, that are successful? 
I can talk from a visitor's bureau standpoint. The first thing we say for the community and for the businesses is don't go on social media and pass bullshit around because we got a lot of that. And we got a lot of people saying, oh my gosh, such and such is gone. Oh my gosh, this is gone. And that, and that just spread. Uh, don't want to use an analogy there, but it just spread throughout the internet. Um, and so we were really clear, like, you got to be clear, you got to be consistent, you got to be truthful, because those things will keep echoing around for a very long time. The other thing was you had to go back to people that were grieving and say, I know you're hurt, and we're going to console you, um, but, you know, we're going to eventually get through this. It's, it's a very cute, weird time there to be, you know, a business yeah. leader at that point. It's, yeah, it's for up. sure. Lynn? Uh, three things right off the bat, ask them what help they need. Talk to the businesses. This is a very good role for the Chamber of Commerce to do a quick survey and find out what's going on with the businesses, where are they at, what do they need help with? Is it a new location? Is it having a place to work with air conditioning and internet access? Is it help preparing their loan application? Uh, is it help pivoting their business model if they've just lost their customers? You know, Maybe they need help marketing online. So. What kind of technical assistance do they need? And then the other thing, they always need money. So gathering up all the information about the funds that are available. Small business administration, of course, not everyone wants a loan, but are there grants? One of the things that was done really well in Maui is they quickly pulled together the Maui Bridge loan, gr grant, which provided money. Um, you know, it's never enough money, but they did get some money from the state and we're able to deploy that, and I thought that was great. If we could refill that fund, you know, maybe with some philanthropic resources, I think that would be next. Cool. Kalika? I think from a boots on the ground, what worked well is, and, and which at the time didn't look like it was working well, is all the different sectors. Um, and so things were happening simultaneously, but identifying in your, in the, you know, in the areas that weren't quite affected. So we have different neighborhoods. So we had Napili, we had Kahana, we had Honokoi, we had Lahaina, we had Launiopoko. And so we identified the leaders that were in these different areas to, to serve as hubs, but also a voice for their community. So information could be funneled that direction and then be given back to the mayor. I definitely think an advisory committee to the mayor is, is, a, is an amazing thing because we become, in Hawaii, we call it coconut wireless. We become the coconut wireless to him. The good, bad, ugly, insensitive, all the things. He, one thing we love about our mayor is that he's tough and he can take all the lorry comments all day long. And so we have that and that's a, so we, we, you know, and now we have, we have someone in the business community, SNE, you have different people that can give information. But in the early set, it just didn't seem like we were all getting along because transparently we all weren't getting along Everything was called a secret meeting. So I think if you identify who these people are, and that's obviously relationships that have to start now, not just when a disaster happens, and then definitely comms. We need comms. So go get the right comms first. Don't get a comms that you got for a discount because that's not going to work on a disaster. And then divide the comms up so that everybody can get back to whoever the conduit is to the, the main EOC. Great, thank you. And our time is quickly expiring, so we're going to go into lightning round here. Um, talk about working with the government. Uh, what are some of the, it can be very complicated, but also, as we learn in every emergency, everybody working together is essential for getting out of it. So what are, what are your tips? How, how do you, how can you help people, um, you know, businesses navigate working with the government or your community, um, facilitating a healthy, positive connection there? You can probably answer it better than me, Mark, because you, you do the interactions. I'll just say real quickly. I'm just a moderator yeah. today. <laughs> I will say real quick, the government is slow on certain things, and so what's nice if you have those relationships with your government, they can offload it to the uh, nonprofits and the other businesses to do it very quickly. And what they're really good at, which you mentioned the SBA and the support and things like that, you can help be a conduit for them, but they're, they're not as quick to do some things. Great. Lynn? A big part of what I do as a consultant in economic recovery is understand what all the programs are from the government and help the local leaders get access, full access to them. And you know what can they do with the resources? So sometimes I act as a go-between. Like last Friday, I had a meeting with the US Department of Labor making suggestions to them of how they can help the tourism industry. And so you know, 
hiring a consultant is not a bad idea if they really know the federal programs. Great, Kaliko. I think is uh, start your relationships now, definitely. Um, and really from government officials to be able to identify your community leaders that, that can go into these communities. Some of them, you know, maybe not the best, but you can send, identify them. The government officials, and I can just say this as a boots on the ground, the only person we really, 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 really believed, I'm just going to say this, was Tamara Paulton. And she was our councilwoman, and it's because we knew her in the community. We knew her as a lifeguard. And so we had a relationship with her. And so what she said, and she was very mindful, you know, it, she had to make sure that her information came out correctly. But then eventually, over days, and we knew, you, us, many of us know our mayor way prior to him becoming the mayor. And um, for, for the record, he's my uncle, so of course I trusted him as well. But it's because who I saw in the seat of government was also the person I saw at the seat in my grandma's house. And so, but not everybody knew that. So it's really build the relationships now. And then also be discerning. You've got to be discerning. You've got to make sure that, you know, your, your, your local government, you have a relationship with them before a disaster starts. Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, let's talk about, for those of us in tourism, hospitality communities, that moment when it's time to let people back in so that they can help. We saw what happened in Maui. No visitors, no, you know, the economy slows down. Talk a little bit about how do you communicate that your community is open for business? And then what messaging can you use to help the visitors be good guests in your community uh, to make sure they feel comfortable, to make sure they know what's the appropriate way to approach people? So, um, Kalika, maybe you have the most direct recent experience with that. So when, when we had decided to open uh, for business, there was a video that had, had been put together and it was really playing on loop in all of the hotels. And it was cultural leaders, it was business people, and they, weren't, they were just saying, be mindful of, of where you go and, and what to notice. And the message wasn't, um, don't come. The message wasn't, um, it was just a, it was a very nice message and it was from people that were very reputable in our community. And, but the thing about it is, and I'll say this because when I first saw the video, I was like, wow, where's our, where's our people from Lahaina? But now looking forward, you know, a year later, it was those that were waiting in the wings to help. How can I help? And I didn't, honestly, I didn't understand that because I thought, well, all the message from Lahaina should come from Lahaina. But we weren't emotionally in the right place, and I didn't know that until this video. And now I watch the video and I go, we need a 2.0 version. Because whoever had wrote the script for that video didn't say, no, we don't want you, don't come. And it also didn't say, you know, it was a very graceful, it was a very open, but also to be very, very mindful. And, and the message came from all businesses. And... I just thought it was whoever had done that was very thoughtful um, of everyone. So, great. To, uh, follow up on that, Kalika, that's right. And it's, um, we, they call it permission to travel, right? Because all these people, they're your biggest fans. They've come here, they've been to your destination, they had their honeymoon there, they, they love you, right? But now they're scared, they don't know how to help. And so you have to give people the permission to travel, but then you also have to say, and this is how you can help us. And I know. Maui had similar issues that we did. People came up here to, to go see the burn, and, and we sent very strongly worded letters to the tour companies, like, you'll never work in wine country again yeah. if I see another one of your buses up there. And um, the people that were ready to be mindful travelers, we kind of explained, right? Go, go support this business, because this business isn't ready for you. Um, and people want to help, right? People love Maui. People love Sonoma. Yeah. yeah. So, um, just a couple of minutes left here. I want to just go through, sometimes uh, we don't choose emergency recovery work. It comes and finds us in the community that we're in. What's something that you wish you knew before you started working on emergency recovery? <laughs> There's 25 hours in a day. Uh, what I wish I knew, man, to... What I wish I knew is that the things that are done previous, and this is not our first fire, but I really, 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 really wish that the recommendations that were made prior were acted on. 
And so it's a, I don't, you know, recovery, I, we didn't sign up for recovery work. It came to find us. And the goal is, is to do and take the 25th hour that doesn't really exist and be wise and, and sit there and think about far, wide, deep. So what I wish I learned is, or what I wish I prepared for is to, I, maybe this is my new calling, I don't know. Yeah, you know? you're and great at it. Obviously you guys are all still here, so <laughs> it, it chases you down for however long. Tamerlan, anything to add? Something you wish you knew before? Um, just, well, on the, on the tourism side, it was that we have the ability to sell this place as an amazing place to come visit. You can also turn that around and use that, the power of marketing and essentially propaganda to help people and to lift them up. And it took us a couple days to understand that we had to do that. So we had to like turn around and say, yes, we're, we're Sonoma County, we're amazing. Let's use this, what we do, and, and do it. And uh, I, wish, I wish I had done that quicker. Yeah. In 17. Then? One of the first things I do in going into any community besides looking at their data is looking at who's doing what because it takes all of us. It takes all of us to make a recovery. No, there are no heroes after the disaster itself. We all, need, we all have a role to play. So the more we can spread the work and make plans to do it together and, you know, go in the same direction, that's to me is the most important because nobody, you know, we've seen so many community leaders burn out and you don't want that. You want to spread the work. Yeah. Okay. And so just time for one more question and really only have the time for one. I'm going to have Kaliko I'm going to address this to you. What, what's something that you've seen because you've been through this so recently, something you've seen that inspired you to keep going or made you feel proud of the recovery efforts you've been working on? Oh, man. Um, what I'm very proud of is, is that our children, uh, I see a lot more land-based programs, um, and that, uh, that really ignites me because it teaches our children that you don't have to be so, and, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but you don't always need technology to grow your food. You don't always need that type of technology to, to make you mentally well. As a culture, we, you know, no matter whether you believe in the Kumulipo or you believe in the Bible, as human beings, we were left to be stewards. And it's exciting to see on the shoreline all of our voyaging canoes come to be a classroom. It's exciting when I have, when I have the opportunity to receive children by the busloads to teach them about their watershed, about the, one of the rainiest places on earth and that the kupuna up there in that forest are so alive more than ever, they're just needing conduits, and those conduits are us. And so it is exciting, it's inspiring, and I, we will do this until every child recognizes that the more trees, they, native trees that they plant, the farther down the rain will come. Beautiful. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause.